I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. This is BBC News from London. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Your first audience with Her Majesty the Queen is really a pretty nerve-wracking experience because the Equery tells you all sorts of things that you've got to do, how, how, where to shake hands, how to shake hands, what to say, how to address Her Majesty, and you're kind of worried you're going you're gonna to stuff it up. But after a few moments, it becomes incredibly uh, informal, and she's brilliant at asking questions that elicit a great torrent of, uh, of stuff, and there's a lot of laughter. Uh, there certainly was with uh, the audiences that, that I had. Sadly and rightly, I can't tell you what uh, she said or what we said, but there was a lot of laughter. Well, of course, this was taken at my first audience because my first audience was the one when I went to the palace and the Queen invited me to form a government. And at that moment when you walk through the door and you have that first audience, it becomes real that you are Prime Minister, you're taking on this privileged position, but also this responsibility. But Her Majesty was so good at putting everybody at their ease. And both that audience and the audiences I then went on to have with her subsequently, they were conversations. She was incredibly well informed, had immense experience, knowledge and wisdom. And it's a moment uh, in the week when you're away from the hurly-burly of politics, and you can actually sit down with somebody with experience and wisdom, knowledge and understanding, and have that conversation about the issues of the day. Well, my first audience was pretty extraordinary because, of course, we had a hung parliament. The Conservatives were much the biggest party after a great election victory in 2010. But when I went to see Her Majesty, uh, I had to ask, uh, I'd like to form a government, but I can't tell you exactly what sort of government it's going to be because Gordon Brown had left Downing Street and the coalition hadn't quite been put in place. So I think although she had seen prime ministers come and prime ministers go, I think this was probably the first time someone had said, I can't tell you exactly what the government's going to look like, but I will form one. Well, the first audience was surprisingly relaxed. Um, I expected it might be a little distant, a little difficult, but it wasn't. Uh, I was greeted at the door, I was introduced to the Queen, we sat down in two chairs. There was absolutely no one else present except a, a large ring of corgis, most of whom were well behaved, but not invariably on every occasion. And that was it, there was no private secretary, no notes, and it was just a conversation. Nothing was barred, nothing was out of court, everything was discussed. And if the Queen wished to raise uh, subjects, she did. If she wished to respond to what I was telling her, she certainly did. And I found it uh, both very cathartic, very interesting, and something, frankly, that one looked forward to each week. It was an extraordinary treat to be able to go to Balmoral um, every year for six years. Um, and one of the best parts was when, in the evening, you'd get into Her Majesty's car, a Range Rover, and she would drive at breakneck speed up the hill and onto the moor. And there, at a sort of converted bothy, an old cottage on the hill, would be the Duke of Edinburgh with a barbecue he'd built himself, barbecuing grouse for your dinner. And I'm not making this up. You sat down and Prince Philip and Her Majesty the Queen served your dinner and cleared it away and washed it up uh, while you sat talking with the other guests. And I remember uh, I think it was sort of year five, I thought, well, I know, surely can help, and got up and put on the marigolds and started doing the washing up. And I remember Her Majesty saying, what on earth is the Prime Minister doing? I'd broken with the protocol, rapidly sat back down and did what I was told. The UK hosted the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 2018. 
and we were very fortunate Her Majesty was at the opening ceremony in Buckingham Palace and she was also uh, willing to open up she very kindly opened Windsor Castle up for us to have uh, some of the part of the meeting one of the events that I remember was we were having a meeting at Windsor Castle we were having a lunch we had a reception before the lunch Nobody apart from myself and one or two officials knew that Her Majesty would be coming to that reception. She walked into that room and immediately the atmosphere changed. There was this huge sense of love and respect for her and people wanted to talk to her and uh, she just had uh, lit the room up. I know for a fact that world leaders coveted nothing more than to be bathed in the luster of her radiance. And I remember vividly as foreign secretary, how they would lobby me, I won't give you their names, but they would lobby me uh, to come not on, a, not on a government to government visit. They didn't want to meet the politicians. They wanted a state visit because they hoped for the chance to meet Her Majesty the Queen. And that was because they knew quite what she had seen and done in her life. And they knew, like Barack Obama, that she truly was one of the most remarkable world leaders, if not the, the most remarkable world leader that, uh, that he'd ever met. When the Queen was surrounded by other world leaders, uh, particularly at meetings of Chogham, the uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, it was quite extraordinary to see how they all wished to be close to the Queen, to shake hands with the Queen, to be photographed with the Queen. She was not only the head of the Commonwealth, she was to them quite a remarkable figure. It is absolutely and completely impossible to imagine they would have reacted that way had we been a republic and had the head of our state been a president. It was the magic of the monarchy and the magic of that particular monarch that made such a remarkable, a remarkable reaction from people. I think her greatest legacy is demonstrating just what a brilliant model our constitutional monarchy is. She was an extraordinary symbol of national unity. She brought the country together, but she also did so much to represent um, and symbolize Britain abroad. And that was really based on the fact that she was so true to her word when she was in her 20s and said, whether my life be long or short, it will be dedicated to your service. She fulfilled that in every year and every month and every week of her reign. I think the extent to which she was a very human being was most beautifully was most beautifully illustrated when she sat alone in her seat at the funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh. It indicated to the extent that behind the monarch, behind the pageantry, behind the uh, majesty of the throne, there was a family, there was a human, there was a marriage, and the Queen faced exactly the same difficulties in her private life as everybody in this country can imagine in their own lives. And that particular poignant picture is one I think that will remain in my mind for the rest of my life, and I think will remain in history too. One of the striking characteristics of Her Late Majesty was her devotion to duty. She gave a selfless life of service, as she'd committed to when she was 21. At just the age of 21, she said she would devote her life, however long or short, to our service. And she did that. And in a world of, if you like, celebrity and sort of um, people wanting to grab the limelight, she was very humble as well. And I hope that there will be a legacy for the country of more of a sense of the importance of service and duty. I think there has been no other monarch in our history who has seen such a phenomenal increase in the prosperity, in the opportunity, in the longevity of the, of the British people as she has in her reign. And for that reason alone, I think that she should be recorded as Elizabeth the Great.